Hello, everybody, and this is Stacy from The Advisor. And today I'm very excited because we have a very special guest. He is one of our experts on the show, and he has his own podcast. He's a little, he's also part of our podcast community, and he is here today uh, to talk about something that's really important about wearing a bunch of different hats and knowing how to balance them. And just so you know that. Um, uh, Roger is also the president of Universal Business um, uh, Center, and he is just amazing. He has a lot of knowledge in this area. So keep your ears on, listen carefully, because he's going to show you how to do something that we all need a little help on, because it's very hard, no matter what business you're in, to wear a lot of different hats and know how to juggle them. So Roger, I'm so excited to have you back on the show, and especially to talk about this. Uh, you know, Let us know, how do we actually balance a bunch of hats because you know you're always juggling so many different things you know when you especially if you're either a solo business owner or if you have a, you work in a company no matter what the 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 uh the task is when you have more than one responsibility to attain it gets really hectic and stressful to you know know how to juggle it and how to get everything done so how do we do it well, it's a great question. It's one a lot of us deal with. So I appreciate the opportunity to come back and address it. So you're right. Whether we're a solopreneur or a business owner with many individuals with whom we're working, there's still that task of all these things that we're responsible for bearing on our shoulders, standing on our head, these many hats that we're proverbially wearing, and how do we actually organize and manage those? And so I'm going to share with you today a process that's very effective, very useful to actually follow and remove a lot of the anxiety that we may be experiencing as we're weighed down on by all these uh, different responsibilities we're sharing. It's called the universal business model. And the universal business model is something I'm excited to explore with you today. Yes, I'm very excited to hear about it. Now, is there a bunch of steps that's required? Like, how do you know what's important and what's not? Because a lot of times when I work with clients, the biggest thing is, is they're focusing on the non-important things. They're focusing on things that could be put on the bottom of the list. And a lot of times the day goes by so quick and the things that they need to get done in order to profit or to be able to complete uh, projects or things that would actually help them elevate to new different levels, they have it in the middle of the list or they're just, they're not even thinking about a list. They're just trying to get everything done. And the things that are really important so they can make money and profit and grow, they they don't get those always accomplished. And then they it's put to the side to the next day. And then before you know it, you have other things you have to attain. Then you have those things from the day before. And they're wondering why, why are we lacking in this area? Why don't we have enough money in this area? Why isn't this coming in? We made this much money last month, but we're not making that this month, you know? It's, and so, you know, how do, how do people know how to prioritize and really know what's important and what's could wait and be put on the side a little bit? Well, the first thing that we're going to do that's part of the universal business model is what we call mapping the business. Mapping the business is a very simple process. What we're basically trying to do is whether it's our personal life or our business life, and we're going to focus on business today, we're wearing all these hats. We need to actually move from being overwhelmed and anxious to at least being whelmed. Well, let's just be whelmed and we'll be happy. So the yeah. point is, is we're going to go through this mapping process by first of all, recognizing that every business, regardless of their size or their age, has these three core components. The first of which is M, marketing and sales. We've got to grow the business. And so there's various things that we're responsible for that are related to sales, growing the company, top line revenue. The second is A. That's the second acronym as part of MAP. And A represents the numbers in the business. Of course, it represents accounting, but it is more than just the accounting, the financial reports. It's getting to the key performance indicators, the various numbers we need to focus on as we run our business. And then the third is P, production. It's what happens after the sale. And there's two sides to this coin. First of all, it's with with regards to the customer, the client, it's our relationship with them. What did they buy? What are they expecting? How can we deliver it? How can we wow them in this experience? And then it's also the internal communication that's going on within the organization. What are we doing to coordinate so that we're efficiently working and taking care of the client doing so profitably? So if you've got mapping the business, marketing and sales, accounting and production working together, that's where we're going to find the profit. When these are it's kind of separate and autonomous and not collaborating, they don't function 
uh, together so that they're profitable. And so what we're going to try to do is take these, these uh, stacks of hats and responsibilities and put them into one of these three categories. Is this thing a project, a task, a thing that I need to focus on related to growing the business? Is it regarding running the business? Is it regarding taking care of the customer and getting the work done? And as you go through this process, what used to be overwhelming because it was maybe a hundred tasks, a hundred ideas, a hundred things that need to be done. Now you've got maybe, let's say 20 in one pile, 30 in another, 40 in another. Well, now they're getting sizable to their to where they're manageable. And that's that's a process right there that is first and foremost. Now, I'll tell you that one of the things that helps in this process is to go through this exercise of every time you get an idea of recording it, writing it down, documenting it. These ideas, especially as we get older, they kind of kind of fleet from our mind. Or more importantly, as we have so much going on in our head, we'll have a great thought. If we don't write it down, it's like, oh, I, I knew I needed to remember that. What was it? Just write it down. And as you write it down, find a time maybe once a week to go ahead and organize these by mapping out your ideas. And that way you're organized for the coming week or month. In that process, you've now mapped the business. And that's step one. Wow, I like that. I like that. And I especially like that, you know, you, you broke it down into three things, growing the business, running the business, and taking care of the customer. Three important aspects and, and three things that, you know, you can you can kind of separate and you can also you know try to if is it good to like maybe if you have all three things to do and you're trying to juggle these and maybe not try to overwhelm yourself and do all in one group all at once but maybe say okay let me see if i could do the first five up here maybe do the first five up here and maybe do the first five up here or you know now you have it mapped out it looks a lot more organized you see what needs to get done you know how much time do you spend with each group is there you know is there a particular amount of time that you should invest in each one and you know in order to make it productive and help the, the business grow properly well we're not to that point yet but you're right we want to figure out where we need to spend our time but in order to know that answer we've organized everything but we still have to prioritize them and so okay. now that everything's organized we're going to prioritize these lists because clearly in the marketing the accounting production there are things that we have control over there are ideas that would be nice but we can take care of them in 6 months there are things that are urgent that we've got to take care of today or tomorrow so we've got to prioritize what does need to take place as regards to or in regards to marketing and sales, accounting, cash flow, production, taking care of the customer. So once we prioritize these, it becomes a lot more apparent. Okay, here's something I have control over and it will have a large impact, an immediate impact, a sizable impact. Knowing that I can then take of the 20 things in a certain category, such as marketing and sales, and I can have rise to the top, the one, two, or three things that I need to get done today, this week. That's very important because through the prioritization, now I don't worry about the other, let's say 18 things in the list. I have two things things now to worry about. So the list originally began with a hundred things on my head that I couldn't organize. Now they're organized into these areas. And I've got two that have risen to the top, let's say in the marketing and sales area. Now I've got something I can work on, but it doesn't have to be me. That brings us to the third step, which is, although I've prioritized it, can I delegate it? Is it possible that I can either give it to an employee, maybe even outsource it to another company or service? By doing so, it doesn't have to be me that does it. All of a sudden now it's getting done, but I was able to put the priority on it and emphasize it with whomever's necessary. So once I've organized, I prioritized, and after prioritizing, I can delegate. Right. I like that. You know, that's one of the biggest problems that a lot of business owners I think have is that they try to do everything themselves and they the biggest thing I hear from people is like, but I have to do it myself because they won't get it done the right, the way that it's supposed to get done. And they, they can, it's just that people have to be more flexible and realize, I think that everybody does it differently, but as long as you have the, the outcome that you have, you know, that you need at the end, it doesn't matter how they do it. If they do it differently than you, as long as you're getting the results, correct? That's true. It's the results that matter. It's not so much the process. It's, it's a much lengthier conversation, but I'll simplify it by saying this. 
the more you can systematize the process, it's easier to delegate. So if it's clear what the tasks are, what the steps are, it's more likely they're going to follow the routine that you expect. But the other thing I would add to this is the fact that if you've documented it, it is something you can delegate and eventually have somebody be responsible for. And so it is encouraging to now document what's happening, to have this recorded process that others can actually implement. So there is something to be said about that, but I'll definitely tell you that when it comes to delegation, I do know a number of people, like you said, that if you want it done right, you've got to do it yourself. You've got to break yourself of that mentality and go like you pointed out to the results. What is it that you ultimately want? And then walk away and trust that somebody else can do it, especially if you've given them, given them the steps to follow. Right. Exactly. Yes. I agree a hundred percent. And that, you know, I've had that conversation with so many people and it, I think it's it's breaking that habit in their head, you know, because I think people get so used to a routine that it's hard to break the routine, you know, because they've done it for so many years a specific way that, you know, but things change. If you've ever like, I'll, you know, for, like if you think of kids is in grade school, like if your kids come home from grade school and they have mathematics homework, you know, the way we did it is not the way they do it, you know. That's right. You know, my kids are growing up, but I remember them coming home from school and my, my child needed a... Uh, they they needed help with their math homework and i did it the old school way the division and they looked at me and they got all upset this is not the way we're supposed to do it you know even though we came out with the same answer you know yep. <laughs> yeah and then you go get your abacus out and you try that for a minute and that wows them so no yes yeah, so there's different ways to skin the cat and so we want to go ahead and focus on what is the end result that we're looking for here skin the cat's probably not the best analogy but i gave you that one here you go <laughs> So after after you start to delegate, what would be the next thing that you start to do? So now we 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 we've looked at the hats, we've organized them, we've we've um, delegated them to different um, people who could handle the tasks. Uh, what would be the the next step that we need to really uh, focus on? Well, the big part of the universal business model is once we've mapped the business and we've gone through this process of organizing, prioritizing, and hopefully delegating, is to step back as the leader and actually now work on the business. And the universal business model now is affording us this opportunity to prioritize what needs to be happening in the organization. So in order to work on the business, it's broken up into three segments, short-term, midterm and long-term. And for each of the three areas, marketing and sales, accounting and production, there is a short-term, midterm and long-term objective. And so what I'd like to do is actually go through each of these with you, if I may, is that all right? Definitely. I would love all right, to hear. So let's start. Let's start with the short term. The short term is ideally what your employees are focused on. So if you're a solopreneur, that means you. But if you're actually an organization that has employees, these are the people that are involved in the day-to-day -day operations of the business. And there's three things that need to be taken care of. As it relates to marketing and sales, it's the philosophy that nothing happens until you make a sell. It is the emphasis of right now, today, we're focusing on sales. What can we do right now that will actually bring in revenue? And if you're in that marketing and sales mindset, you're always going to have something in the pipeline. And it's very important that you understand that every day needs to consist of something that you're doing that's marketing and sales related. Are you actually doing something that will bring in revenue? The second thing is for accounting, it's cash flow cash flow, cash flow. As it relates to running the business, you always need to be sensitive and aware of what's happening as it relates to cash flow. And in the accounting department, you've got your payables, receivables, what's going on to make sure we've got money in the bank to pay the bills, to make payroll. That's a priority. And so we've always got to be sensitive to whether or not we have the cash needed to run the company. Cash is king. And then as it relates to production, production is where we focus on pouring on the communication. It's the communication with the customer, setting the expectations as to what's going on with that transaction. Okay okay, we've got this process. You should be getting this tomorrow. This should come in the mail to the next day. You're going to be getting a tracking code. Here's the receipt. I mean, it's just the constant communication with the customer. So they don't feel as if you just took the money and ran. You're now actually taking care of them. And then the other is the flip side, as I mentioned before, it's internally what's being communicated within the staff. Hey, we just enrolled somebody who sold somebody, they bought something. Here's what they're doing. Here's what they got. Here's what we need to do. And it's communicating. One great example of this is when the sales team makes a transaction, a sale, 
what did they say to the customer? What did they perhaps overemphasize or point out that the communication needs to be on the fulfillment side of, oh, the customer particularly is interested in this. This is what matters most to them of the transaction. They were eager for this particular part. Well, if we can communicate that, we won't drop the ball. And so it's that internal communication of making sure everybody knows what's going on, everyone is clear as to what's expected of them. And that communication is very key and it's unique in every business, but what are you doing to facilitate that communication? So again, on the short term, day to day at the employee level, nothing happens until you make a sale, cash flow, cash flow, and pour on the communication. I like that. I like that. And sometimes I think people kind of lack on the communication. You know, they don't realize how important it is, but it's a very important aspect. You have to communicate well with your with the customer, understand what the customer's wants and needs are. And then if the customers are unsure about something, you have to know how to communicate well and to explain to them the importance of maybe having that service or be, you know, or you know, doing something a certain way and how we can incorporate this, you know, into that. A lot of times people aren't clear enough or they don't they don't really approach the the customer in the right way when it, it's just a, a way of, of speaking to the customer that can make a, a huge difference now are there certain things like pros and cons that you see like the way way salespeople or customer service people work with customers that are really good and then some you know aren't so good and maybe common mistakes that you've seen across your your experience yeah, there's a number of things, but one I'll share with you right now is a common mistake that's made is being reactive in business, too reactive where the customer has to initiate things. Hey, where is this? What's happening next? What's what's this going to be? The customer shouldn't be the one kind of prodding the conversation along as it relates to the transaction. It needs yeah. to be pouring on the communication to basically kind of kill with kindness, if you will. It's giving them more information. Now, I'm not trying to suggest that we overwhelm them to the point they're just not going to say or pay attention to anything we're saying, but you want to actually give them that notification of, oh, thank you for the transaction. It's gone through. Oh, by the way, here's what's going to happen next. Here's the next steps. This is what you can expect. Oh, here's the timeline in which you can expect it. Let me introduce you to this person that you may be working with. By the way, if you have any questions, call this number, email us here, call this individual. It's basically trying to get ahead of things so that the customer is at least aware that they've not been forgotten. You took my money. Now what's going to happen with it? And it varies company to company. If it's a single transaction where it's just a product that's being sent, well, clearly you just want to communicate that it's on its way. By the way, did it arrive? Can you give us a review? But for other things that are maybe service oriented or long term in duration, it's what's that customer journey going to be like as they're being onboarded? And what can you do to get get ahead of the experience so that it's a positive, favorable experience, an easy experience. And so that's the communication aspect. I like that aspect because I think a lot of times people forget to, you know, they'll take the, the person's money and they'll they'll work on the project, but then they're not really letting them know what's going on. And they're they're a coolest on the other side. And, you know, and then some people get nervous. You know, there's many times where people have had bad experiences in the past. And they, when they, they make new transactions with a new company, they get nervous again because they've had past experiences that weren't so good. So to gain the confidence and their, their trust and their respect, you should have that constant ongoing relationship I think with your customer that way that trust and that bond you know really correlates and and grows stronger so you could have a you know you, you want to have a consistent you know not just a one-time service with your customer but you want mm -hmm. a long ongoing relationship with your customer I think well, let me give you a, a great example, and this is a recent one. Well, not so recent, but you'll understand. I, I uh, a few years ago, had custom suits that were uh, made for me. Beautiful suits. Absolutely love them. They are my most favorite suits. They're wonderfully done. Uh, they, they're embroidered with my name and everything. I mean, it's over the top what they did for me, even yeah. over the top in the sense that I didn't expect some of the things that they did. It was just beautifully done. Well, here's the problem though. When I did the transaction, it was a fair transaction, but after the sizing and everything else, it, they just went dark. I'd never heard from them. And I had to literally try and find them online. Couldn't find the company name as I understood it. Had to go find one of the employees because I had a business card and I had to go find them. And I found them on social media and I had to reach out to them through a direct message saying, Hey, can you give me an update on this? Well, yeah. it wasn't even an owner of the business. It was an employee. And they're like, yeah, sure. Well, they were slow to respond. It was through social media. So it's not like it's an email thing that they're going to get to on a daily basis. So I had made this connection. They later got back with me. Oh yeah, it's being processed. Well, that was it. They didn't give me a timeline or anything else. 
what I understood to take about a month to turn around and give me my suit took probably as many as three months. So there was a period of time in here, not only when the communication was lacking, but I actually thought I'd been taken advantage of. I thought I was out the money. I mean, yeah, they sized me and I picked out the materials and so forth. But at the end of the day, I didn't know where these people were. I didn't know who they were. And so it started to make me quite uneasy and nervous. Well, here's the kicker. Not only did I get the suit and I was pleasantly surprised and very happy, even though I had to wait, yeah. I've wanted to get another suit. I've wanted to buy another suit. I have no clue how to contact these people. I have no yeah. means to get hold of them. I would love to have them do some other suits for me. Why? Because they were that good. Right. Poor communication. Poor communication. I love them so much. I would refer them. I don't even know who they are now. So the problem is, is not only can I not get suits, I can't even refer them all because they've failed to actually communicate with me. I've actually hunted in the suit itself to see, is there any contact information in there that I'm overlooking? Yeah. I can't believe this. And the only communication I had was some social media communication. I can't remember who the individual was. That's horrible. But again, a testament to the fact that poor communication can really hurt your business model. Oh yeah, definitely. That's a great example. And I've seen, I've seen things like that all the time. And it's a shame because businesses, you know, so many businesses can really thrive because they do have a good product, but they're, their customer service stinks. And that a lot of times if their customer service stinks, that will draw a customer away. They'll be like, you know, even though they like the product, I don't think I'm going to do it again. Yep. Great tailor, great materials, wonderful suit. I can't get a hold of them. <laughs> and I'm sad. It was a great deal. Took a lot of time, lost them, but it was a good deal. So. Right. Right. Yeah. No, it sounds like it. Oh my goodness. But it's a shame because you see that all the time, you, you know, and it's, it's, it's really sad. Now, when you, at these, when you do these steps, are there other steps that are also included in, 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 the, in mapping out the, um, there are, uh, so there's basically nine total. The first three are the short term, right? That's at the employee level, the day to day. The next is at the quarterly level. So that's mid-management. Management, when you have them involved, they're looking at things differently than the day-to-day. -day. They need to be a little bit more forward thinking. They need to be looking out for tomorrow. And so we look at it from a monthly or quarterly basis. And here are the three that they're responsible for as it relates to the business. First and foremost, as it relates to marketing and sales, a good deal is only a good deal if it's a good deal for both parties. Management needs to be looking at the sales, the discounts, the promotions, and making sure that there's profitable margins in there for the company. Sometimes what happens in business is you can get this promotion going where you think you're doing a great deal because all of a sudden the sales go up and accounting walks in and says, okay, I need you to understand every sell you're making, the company's losing money because the cogs associated with that transaction is more than you understood. And so the discount that somebody approved, I don't know who, that's now being given to the customer is too much. We're losing money on, on the transaction. I can tell you that I've had numerous instances where sales are booming. The commissions are going out. People are making good money. And on the sales side, everyone's happy. In the back end, they're like, stop the insanity. We're losing money with all these transactions. Stop yeah. it now. But the sooner you can address that, the better. And that's why management needs to walk in and say, is the good deal both good for the customer, for the salespeople, for the company? Is it a win, win, win? And only if that's the case, can you uh, then run with it? Well, the point is, is you can also, from the sales perspective, understand what does the company need? This particular product has the highest margin. Well, let's promote that next month. This particular product is going to expire. Let's promote that next week. This particular product is seasonal. We've got to get this out the door now because after this window, it's not going to be relevant anymore. They right. need to, as management, be focusing on what's a good deal for the customer, the salespeople, and the company. The second happens to be accounting, and that's knowing your numbers. Management needs to be looking at the financials, the KPIs, watching the numbers, observing the leading and lagging indicators that exist in the business. They need to know the numbers, and that's essential. The third is regarding production. With productions, it's in improving the internal processes. Management needs to look at, you know, is there some technology we should perhaps be considering? Is there a better way to package our products? Maybe something's being damaged in the mail. Can we actually ship it differently or better? You know, this is more expensive as a cog. Should we go to a new supplier? 
The, the whole idea is taking the process and figuring out what can we do differently today than we've done in the past that's perhaps more affordable, probably better received by the customer, a better product in the end. That's something that management needs to be focused on. And again, this isn't at the employee level. This is at management. And typically, you've got these quarterly emphasis or priorities that are being focused on. I like that. Yeah. And that's another thing is that a lot of people, they, they, they have, dis, they have prices and they put these discounts and they might be old prices and they don't realize, you know, they put these, these bigger discounts on and you're barely making any profit. And, and, and it's really, you're losing money by, by making this deal. And it's causing, it's causing probably for some time for some, depending on the product or the service, it's causing time to do this. And, and you're really, you're not making any profit, you know, and you're sometimes losing money doing, doing it. And, oh, yeah. you know, that, that really, I think really has to be kept on because it's, it, it could happen so easily and it gets lost with all the other, you know, stuff like the products and if they have more than one products and services, you know, it's sometimes, you know, if you have it in different places, products going or services in different places, it could easily, you know, overlook something until someone purchases it. And then you're like, wait a second, you know? <laughs> And you realize, you know. Oh, yeah. Well, one of the things that's very common today is take, for example, restaurants with inflation. You've got the different produce that's costing more. And if you don't have a price change in your menu, you could very well be serving food that's costing you money because you didn't raise your prices enough on maybe the produce or maybe the the uh, meat or whatever. So that's yeah. a problem that's very real. And with inflation today, if you're not raising your prices based on the margins that you see in the financials, you're doing it blindly. You're saying, let's raise prices. But honestly, you don't know if it's too much, too little. You just are raising them to say, check. I did it, but honestly, right. was it an intelligent decision? So yes, this whole area here is very, very important as it relates to mid-management. Definitely, definitely. And I, I think that's something that should really be looked at seriously. And they should probably, I would think if you have someone in the office that does it or delegate it to somebody who knows their numbers and knows what's going on and can do the research and then look at what you're doing and then come out with some kind of common ground. Cause not everybody is good with the numbers and not everybody, you know, can figure out those things and stuff like that. Well, by all means, if you're not working with an accounting professional, this is a great place to leverage them because they can come in, look at the financials, point out to you trends. They can analyze things. They can give you insights that you may not have because the numbers may be foreign. It's a different language. Accounting is the language of business. And as yeah. a business owner, you're great at what you do, but you may very well have to work with an accounting professional that can interpret what the numbers are saying and draw your attention to things that need attention. And that's where it's not... It's not bad to say that you are great at what you do and you need help from someone else. The accounting is typically the first thing that's outsourced in order to run a business successfully. It's the first thing you say, I don't have enough work to hire someone, but I definitely need to bring in an expert. And I definitely think that's true. I, I think it, you really have to have an expert come in or, you know, or an accountant and, and ha either have, you know, an accountant come in or, you know, some people have both. They have like a bookkeeper in the office and they have an accountant and they they kind of work hand on hand where they give them the numbers and they give, they give the accountant the work and he looks over everything and checks things and, sh and the bookkeeper will like organize everything and make sure that everything is sent over to them so they can analyze everything and go through everything. And it's not, it's not an easy task and it's not for everybody. I can tell you one thing. When I was in college, I I think I went up to accountant three and I was like, whoa, okay, I had enough. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. You're doing good here. You know, it's, it's not numbers are not meant for everybody. You have to have a certain type of, of you know, ability, not at number. You know, some people are really good with numbers and some people, you know, are OK with numbers. But you want someone, especially in like an accountant, to be looking at your business because that's not something you want to play with. Oh, yeah. Now, you were saying that there's another step. What's the other step? I'm curious. The last one is long-term. Long-term happens to be what the business owner is responsible for. And honestly, they can't delegate this. So clearly, if you've got short-term, you can give it to the employees. If you've got management, you can give them the mid-term. But the long-term is the vision that the company is, is given by the business owner. So it's not something that you can abdicate. So at the end of the day, you need to be the one focused on these three things that I'm about to share with you. As it relates to marketing, it's what we say, grow your business geometrically. 
The obvious is vertical growth. Vertical growth is basically taking what you're doing now and selling more of it, doing more of what you're already doing. Geometric right. is listening to your customer and seeing what else would they be willing to pay for that you're currently not charging. This is a new revenue stream that last year you haven't been charging for, and it's not bringing in a, a revenue line. But in the accounting next year, you're going to have a line dedicated to this to actually see new revenue coming in from a new product or service that you're providing. Why? Because geometric you grew, grew your business listening to your customers. They know, like, and trust you. They are willing to pay you for additional services because they already like what you're doing for them now. So are there missed opportunities that you could be charging for that right now today you're not currently offering? And that's the first thing. Now, as it relates to accounting, accounting then becomes planning for tomorrow. As you grow your business, as you're looking to expand, hire employees, maybe open a new location, it's going to take revenue. It's going to take uh, basically cash flow. So do you have the line of credit available with the bank? Do you have a lending option? Do you have uh, access to capital? What do you have as you're needing to grow the business? And as you're planning for tomorrow, what do you see as the needs? Have you gotten the numbers you need to forecast and budget accordingly? And so it's really as a business owner planning for the next year, the next two years, what are the things that are going to need to change? We're going to need to buy a new vehicle, a new machine. We're going to have to upgrade software. We're going to need to hire a, hire a new manager. We're going to have to hire the two new salespeople. Well, those things not just only have a cost, but they have a, a ripple effect within the organization. You hire a, a person, well, clearly you're going to need to do more advertising if it's a salesperson to generate more leads for that person to stay busy. These are yeah. things that you have to think through. And as a business owner, you're the one that's at the forefront that has to take, take this into consideration. The last is production. Production is basically taking what you have and making it better. It's literally looking at your product, your processes, and seeing, is there a simpler, better way to do this? Is there a better way to deliver? Deliver a product or service? Is there a better way to do the work internally? That right there is where all these things are going to converge. And as I pointed out at the beginning, as these three are working efficiently, you're going to be profitable. And what we're trying to do is make more profit. So these nine things are what we refer to as the universal business model. They are the nine principles to make your business profitable. Oh, I love it. I love it. Now, with when it comes to this, do you... It, if you had to really break it down and you had to really want to, you know, summarize this, you know, what would be the, like the most important things you want to emphasize to the listeners? Because, you know, I, one thing I, you just said that I thought was brilliant was that, you know, listen to the customers and see what they need so you could actually plan for next year, a serve a new service, you know, mm -hmm. could outsource more income, you know, bring in more income. And also it's something that you may not have been thinking about charging for, but you have lots of people who are willing to do it because they either don't have the time or they don't want to be bothered. They'd rather have someone else just do it for them. And, you know, I think a lot of people sometimes overlook that and they don't and they don't really uh, listen to the customers and they could be probably be bringing in more services and more money into the company if they if they listen better. Oh, yeah. Well, think of it this way. I mean, a great example of this would be McDonald's. Years ago, there was this idea of supersize. And so the question was, could you have the cashiers at the time of the transaction just ask, would you like to supersize that? Would you like to go from the small fry to the large fry? Would you like to go from the small drink to the large drink? Just a dollar more, that kind of a thing. Well, they realized just simply asking caused revenue to go up, sales to go up. And it was simply because they put into their process this mere ask, well, how did they know to offer larger fries or offer a larger drink? It's because they were listening to their customers. So yeah. what we're doing is you're paying attention. And it wasn't that they didn't see the need. It's just at first, you're probably looking at simplifying. I don't know if you've ever you know, noticed this, but some restaurants simplify it. There is only one drink. There is only one size. And that's because back in the back, they're not having to have different size cups. They're not having to have different portion sizes. They just kind of streamline the process. Well, yeah. if you're streamlining, sometimes you're missing opportunities. And it's like, you know, maybe we could actually offer this and in doing so generate additional revenue. But that's the visionary approach to business. It's not your line person that necessarily is going to come up with this. It's you listening to the customers as a business owner to say, here's how my company can adapt and meet the needs of my customers. And then they'll pay more for this new thing. I think that's a great idea. And, and also the last comment that you made too is, is planning for the future and looking at the trajectory and, and looking at the next two years, maybe, or looking at, you know, and, and start planning. I don't think a lot of, a lot of companies that, you know, people that I know that own companies and they, they, 
or I should say small businesses, um, a, lot of, a lot of them are so immersed in what's going on right now that they're not really planning for the future. They're just figuring out what's going on in the present and what they need to do right now. And not everyone, you know, I'm not going to say all, but a lot of them don't think about in the next two years, what's going to happen and what they can, you know, input and stuff like that. You know, they, they have ideas and they might jot them down and put it on a sticky note, but they are not really, you know, creating an actual plan. Yeah. The problem that we're running into is the fact that as a business is growing, you can vertically grow your business and do well with sales. But what you're not realizing is how the market may be changing. I'll give an example. We're in a, we're a post-secondary school for accounting professionals. As a school, we started 40 years ago in a traditional classroom environment. You come to a class, sit at a desk, listen to a professor or a teacher teaching from the front of the classroom. Today, all of my campuses are closed. We closed all the 22 locations. They're closed. All the training we provide now is online. Well, from that initial experience, if we were stubborn and closed-minded enough to say, no, we're a school and a school is traditional, we have classrooms. If we were going to be that, we'd be out of business today. It was the fact that we evolved and changed with the times to realize that we could deliver the content, the training online. We could offer people the ability and flexibility to do the classes when they wanted to, where they wanted to, as quick as they wanted to. Well, that affordability only came because we adapted. And if we were listening, we would adapt. If we weren't listening, we would be stubborn and say, well, no, this is how we do business. It's a classroom. There's chairs. Come sit down. Well, that would be the death of my company as it is. So we've evolved. We're not the same company. Uh, the I'm the third president of the company. It was not uncommon for the first president of the company to come in when he was retired to simply come into my office and simply say, so what do you do here? He literally would look across the table and, or off the, across the desk and say, so what do you do here in the office again? What, what are you doing? And it was simply because he had been removed enough from the business model. He didn't understand how we were making money anymore as a company. That right. needs to be the evolution you experience as a business. How are you yeah. different tomorrow than today? Because the market is changing and those who change and adapt will thrive. Yes. I agree. That's excellent advice. That's excellent advice. And especially nowadays, what a thrive, what a, we, are, we are changing so rapidly. It's it, things are, you know, I, I think changing more quicker than I, I have ever seen it, you know, and, and people are really looking to do things more online. They don't have time, you know, you see, I, I, even with students, I see a lot of college students going for their master's and they're, they don't have time. They get, a, they get a, a job right out of college and they're still, they're they're still going for their master's. And instead of sitting down and having into a traditional university, they're, you know, they're going, they're getting up in the morning, they're going to work, they're coming home, they're having their dinner, and then they're throwing on, you know, their, 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 their computer and they're going and they're studying and they're listening to the program and they're doing what they have to and listening to what the professor reported and, and doing, doing the, uh, the homeworks and, and the, and everything else that they have to do accordingly mm -hmm. to, obtain that master's and things are just just so different nowadays it's it's you know and you really do because that's one problem i see is that i've seen great companies and great and great small businesses that are that have so much potential you go in there and and they are doing great but they could do so much better if they move more towards the future and the and the way things are going they're still stuck back like a, a decade ago they're still doing things the old school way you know and it's like if they only change things up a little bit and started to move a little bit more towards you know 2024 they could probably make so much more money yep you've got to be willing to change and adapt yes that's and that's 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 perfect change and adapt you know we should make that our slogan we you know change and adapt <laughs> i'm all for it <laughs> Definitely. Now, if we had to take today's conversation and you wanted to emphasize on some really important aspects of our conversation today, what are some things that you'd really like to get across to the listeners that you think are really important for them to understand? First of all, that there is a turnkey process that you can follow to run your business. I think a lot of times as entrepreneurs, we're wondering how do we wing it as well as we do? We feel as if we're just trying to make things work. Well, honestly, you're not inventing the wheel here. So it's already in place. Business has been around forever. What we need to do is take tried and proven principles and apply them in our business. And that way we can apply what does work to our situation. And so this is essentially a universal business model. It's one that you can apply in your company and do so successfully 
successfully because what it does is it allows you to focus on the things that need your attention, whether it's short-term, mid-term, or long-term. And so this whole philosophy of mapping the business is meant to free you from the anxiety, the overwhelm that you're experiencing. It allows you to prioritize the things that you're doing, delegate those that you can, and then actually focus on the business as it relates to these nine principles that I mentioned. That's great. I, I think, you know, and one question that came to my head as you were summarizing everything that we discussed was that a lot of people, they do things differently. You have people that write in notebooks and they create mm -hmm. their plans in notebooks. You have some people who create sticky notes. And I know people that have sticky notes all over their office room, you know, yep. and then have people that use Excel and do different softwares. You know, what do you find, you know, when people are trying to organize their business, trying to map out their business and, and really prioritize what's important and, and you know, really de and delegate to certain areas and, and really get everything well organized. Is there a specific way of doing it that makes life easier for the owner and the company and even the accountant that's helping them out? Yeah. So I've learned this over the years. I'm a big time management person. I'm a believer in block uh, block time management. And so when you block out on your calendar areas that uh, are for this task or another project, it makes it a lot more efficient. I, I, I basically have learned over the years that as I have ideas come to mind, it's best to uh, capture them on the calendar as to when I'm going to do it. And it allows me on the beginning at the beginning of the week to look at my week schedule and figure out have I prioritized correctly? Oh, this is something that I think is going to take longer and I give myself more time. Oh, I don't have time for that on that day. Okay, I need to move that to another day. You know what? This isn't pressing right now. I'm going to move it to next week. That time management as I block th things out allow me to go into each day with purpose and intent. And so I basically do that at the start of the week. And then every night when I go to bed, I look at the calendar for the next day so that as I go to sleep, I'm able to think about the things that I'm going to be doing the following day. And that way I also know where I'm supposed to be first things first in the morning. Oh, I've got this first thing. And so I'm not waking up in the morning and being surprised. Oh, what am I doing today? No, I went to bed knowing last night what my day was going to look like and what was the first thing on my agenda. So I find that I don't feel as overwhelmed when I use this process because I feel as if I'm proactively putting in not only what needs attention, but the priorities in which I need to address them. I like that. That's very good advice. Because I think that's, you know, everyone has a different method, but I was just wondering, you know, what ones really, you know, from your perspective, especially now that you're an accountant, you know, every, I don't know one accountant that's not well organized. They don't survive if they're not. <laughs> Lots of deadlines. So time blocking, time blocking yeah. works. Yes. So, you know, I was just wondering what was, you know, from your perspective, what you thought, but I think that's great. Now, what are the different services that you provide in your, in your school? So as a school, what we're doing is working with the owners of bookkeeping, accounting, and tax businesses. We work specifically with them to build what I refer to as the premier accounting firm in their area, offering quality accounting services. And for that reason, as a school, we're training their staff to provide quality bookkeeping, accounting, tax services, CFO, advisory type services. So my, my focus, my niche, if you will, happens to be with the accounting profession. Okay. And what other services that you provide? Well, we do offer in a division of our company, Universal Business Builder, we have actually business coaching that we do. And so I do work with a number of business owners as a business coach, and I actually help them implement these principles that we've discussed today and a number of others over the course of a 12 to 18 month engagement. And it's in that process that I actually service them as their business coach so that they can ultimately do what I refer to as building value. It's an asset. Their company is an asset. And so we're trying to work on what we can do to risk mitigate and increase the valuation of the company. Excellent. Now, where can people get in touch with you? Love to connect on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is a great place for us to connect. So you can reach out to me there. Love to you know, message one another there. But at the same time, you can go to universalaccounting.com. Universalaccounting.com has in the navigation free resources. It's there you can actually find this principle of mapping the business, the universal business model in a book called In the Black. In the Black, Nine Principles to Make Your Business Profitable is a free ebook that you can actually request and have. And so I would encourage all of your listeners to go to universalaccounting.com in the free resource section, get the book In the Black, and you'll not regret it. It's a phenomenal book. I think I'm going to download it. <laughs> Good. 
This is this is amazing. I am so glad you came on today to talk about this. I think this is something that really a lot of companies, a lot of businesses, a lot of solo entrepreneurs really need to understand and 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 learn how to really you know go through the the process because it is it is a complex process if you are not good at really you know understanding what's you know how to how to organize it how to your time management what's important where do i put where you know how to break it up how to delegate it you know how you know how do i keep track of everything and and so forth all the different principles that we went over today and I think today you went over it really well and you made it very, very easy to understand. So I think this was a great podcast today. And I thank you so much for coming on the show. As always, it's been such a pleasure. I love having you on and you're just amazing. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. I appreciate the opportunity and always remember this. If it's about accounting, it is universal. <laughs> I love it. Thank you so much, Roger. I look forward to just talking to you again. <laughs> Bye-bye.